Uh, did you notice the cloth on the floor in front of the table? It would not have looked like this in the 19th century. It would have been completely under the table. It would have been a cloth, like a tarpaulin almost like thing, out of a thick material that would have been put down on the floor and the table would have been put in the middle of it and it's referred to as a crumb cloth. You couldn't clean a rug like we can now. There were no vacuum cleaners. Have you ever seen rug beaters, those old things like a tennis racket that you took rugs out and just beat the, beat the dust out of them? Um, in the 19th century, that, that sweeping were all you could do to a rug. So you want to be careful about not grinding food into a rug in a dining room. So a crumb cloth would have been put on the floor. And then after the meal, when everything was cleared away, this table breaks down and folds down to be a drop of a small thing that could move against a wall. The, drop, the, the crumb cloth would have been folded up and taken out. The rug would have been rolled up and taken away, and instantly this was a ballroom. This became a dancing room for when you were entertained. Um, the big table would not be commonly up all the time unless you had company coming. This table could be put up, like in, see where that drop leaf is on the other side of that one? Where it shifts up and comes over and makes a bigger table. It was not uncommon to have a table like this where the two sides drop down. And then you had two half circular tables you could plug on the ends and they could be even bigger to be an oval. If you turn the table on the diagonal from here to that way, you could probably see 16 people at one table in this room. Who has a dining room that big anymore? No, nobody does. Um, my, my table, when I have a big do, if I push it, I can put 10 people if I use this much stuff at the table. When I have extra people, I have two other little so I have a couple here and a couple there. So 14, 16 is my absolute maximum. Um, but when you had a, a, a big event, the table could have gone from here all the way down there to the fireplace. You would have had that much room in here to do that. And when the table broke down, that's why oftentimes it was three components and they all fitted in different places. You can take this one apart and make two out of it, and they fit underneath the windows over there. And you could have had the two half circles that it could fit somewhere else, or be brought to the middle of the room and put together to make a round table at tea time. And the chairs would have been put around that, and that would have been the center table. There were no coffee tables like we have today. There were no low tables in the middle of a room. It was a center table, and it was regular hot. So the two demi looms, the two halves, would have made the tea table. Uh, okay. Dessert beverage, tea, with a coaster. But you don't ever use a coaster on a stemmed glass. It's tempting sometimes because they're pretty to do that. But because it's on the stem, it's not going to sweat on the table. It's not going to leave a ring on your tablecloth. So if you have these little things, they're when you have a flat bottom thing like that. The main course. Okay, there would have been, I told you, assorted meats to pick from. There would have been several vegetables. You've already had the salad thing. You've already had the soup thing. You've already had the seafood thing. You've cleansed yourself down here on the end to be ready for the next one. Then dessert came. This is when you could really show out with real fancy stuff. This is American Brilliant Period Cut Glass. When you see pressed glass, Sometimes you think it's cut glass until you put your hand on it and you touch it. What lets you know it's cut glass is how sharp the design is. When you run your finger across it, it is really sharp where the glass has been cut on the grinding wheel. Somebody would have sat at a wheel, put the major lines in here, and hand cut every detail that you see on this. This is not a machine-made piece. This is why this was such expensive stuff, even in the 19th century, why it was so expensive. I go to the state sales now and it's a giveaway. Young people don't want cut glass. But if you had fine cut glass, people knew you had money in the 19th century because this was one of the flashiest things you could have. This is a fabulous piece of cut glass called a Supreme. Um, I've used them before sometimes for a small breakthrough in the morning when I had breakfast for fancy folks. Uh, but it commonly would have been used as a dessert dish. These pedestal ones are so rare that in all my collecting years, I have only ever found seven. I have a set of four, and I have a set of three. This is one from the set of three. So I've never really done a whole table with them because I don't have enough. But this would have been very impressive to someone because it was so much more difficult to produce a stemmed piece and not damage it in the cutting process. For everyone that turned out okay, there might have been one that bit the dust. Have you ever 
They like it water for places they have seconds sometimes. They've made a long cut, there's one wonky line somewhere around it. Um, I was in, in England one time and I went to one of the second shops and you had to look carefully to see what the mistake was, but they knew it was a call and they had put it to the side because it wasn't a first quality one. But this would have been a very showy thing to have used. Uh, when you look over my list of all different kinds of, of terms of stuff I don't want to forget, okay? Talk about water packs and nut dishes. Uh, roll napkins in place. We didn't talk about that. Okay. How did you serve bread? You had a couple of options. You could use a small platter like this, but most people had a bread tray. This is the bread tray that's in the pattern of this. You refer to sterling in a pattern like this as this is hollowware, although it's not hollow, it's called that. But everybody knows what an old fashioned roll napkin looks like that you opened up and put on the thing. Okay, so this is the standard kind of roll holder. And then we'll bring these two around for you too. This is the European style. Look at this thing. <coughs> this, all these untie and this falls flat. I got this one when I was in Belgium one time. Um, beautiful Brussels lace. I went to a store that sold every lacy thing you could think of in the world. When I saw these, I thought, bingo, I've got to have some of those. Um, it could have been served in a plain basket. It could have been served in some kind of round bowl, but this is a hollowware piece of Francis that matches what's on the table. And a roll would have gone in each one of those little sockets. And that's one of the few things that would have been passed at the table if you had a plated meat. Bread could have been passed and nobody would have thought that was an improper thing to do. If you had enough help, somebody could walk around to all the people and do that. Who has help now of any kind from anything? <laughs> When I have a big fancy meal, sometimes if I wrote one person into helping me, I can manage to plate 12 servings of stuff. Um, what do you do when you have issues like we have now with social distancing and all this kind of stuff? I thought, okay, what's Christmas going to be like last year? My normal 16 people I entertained dropped to six. My table that's bigger than this had four people in it. And I had two people over in another part of the room who were compatible with each other at their separate little table. Um, spaced everybody out, did my regular stuff. I cut from six courses to four. And rather than to let people, what I do when I have a huge number of people is, I set up in another room, I have a breakfast room, I set up in another room the dishes with all the entree things. And people bring that plate Everything else has been served to them but that. They bring that plate, then go and put their own stuff in there. As I've gotten older, I've slowed down and I can't sling it like I used to. So I've <laughs> gone to that in the last two or three years. But this past year, we didn't want people touching spoons that the next person then touched and the next person then touched. So everybody had their plate on the table. I had no set of plates in the other room. And because I only had six, I, with a different spoon for each thing with a glove on, put everything on all the plates and then brought it in to serve it to the six people that I had. Anybody watch the Beautiful Tables thing on Facebook? I, the woman had this odd rule of don't put one thing on there about disease or whatever. I thought it was interesting to know how people had adapted with all this stuff going on. What did, what did you need to do to safely entertain or do anything? And so when I put my Christmas pictures on, I didn't say very much about why I had done what I had done, but I thought it was pretty obvious that if I had that much space between the people at the table, I, I was doing it for a particular reason. Um, the centerpiece on the table would not have looked like this for a meal. I've done this as a show table because most people who go through here for the days that this event happens are going to be standing. They're going to view it as they walk around from higher up than as you're sitting. You don't want to sit down at a table and not be able to see anybody over there on the other side, so you wouldn't have such tall things. If you were having a reception, if you were having a tea, you, uh, you would have a centerpiece like this. You could have something very tall and very impressive because there would be no chairs around the table. The guests would be walking around and picking up finger foods. The piece in the middle is, is, is a, a 19th century epern, and it's sort of a cobbled together mixture of pieces this out. At the estate sale where I found this set of dishes, 
I found just this. No bowls, no anything, just that. And I thought, what an interesting looking thing. I wonder what I could do with it. And one of my best friends from college was with me. He said, if you don't buy that, you're going to regret it. And he said, it is half price today. And of course, you know, that always hooked me. And I came home with it. I already had this bowl, and look at the star. There is a matching star in the middle. And believe it or not, the grooves exactly fit in the middle of this. It was meant to be. The little bowls are just little inexpensive bowls like you'd use to serve fruit in the house, but they happen to fit the holders. When I have a fancy meal, and I use this as a centerpiece in the middle of the table, sometimes I go so high that people can look underneath it. It's not a problem with blocking the view. And I'll put candy in those. In the 19th century, oftentimes, we have gardenias in there for the day because they smell so good. It was very popular in the 19th century to have aromatic flowers in the house. It was like we get out a room freshener and stick it somewhere. When you couldn't get out a little glade thing and stick it in, you brought something in that smelled good. And so this morning, somebody, I think Nina had gardenias in her yard. Um, I just added this because I thought the silver rim looked pretty around the edge. I've always traditionally made flower arrangements where you make them an oasis and they hang out and they do all that kind of stuff. But in the 19th century, there was no oasis. How did you make an arrangement? You made it in a vase like this. This is all just stuff put into a vase. You start with the greenery base, and you rough in the shape of the thing, and then you add all the other components to the scale of what you want to make it look like. Um, I decided to do my arrangements this year like arrangements would have been in the 19th century. They would have been strictly put into a vase like this. Um, you know, remember what an old flower frog looks like? The little spiky things that stuck up? When I was a kid, and my mother was into all kinds of garden club activities, she and all of her lady friends who did flowers used a flower frog, and they came in all different sizes. Um, little bitty ones up to bigger ones like that. And you had to sort of cut the stems at an angle and push them onto those things to kind of lock them into place. And it would rough in the shape of the arrangement and then put the flowers into it. I haven't made an arrangement using a frog in 50 years, or, or more than 50 years probably. But uh, this is what arrangements would have been like. Notice this house is not landscaped. When you walked up, there are shrubs and stuff all around it. That was the popular style in the 19th century. The house was supposed to be appreciated as an architectural, beautiful thing, and the shrubbery took away from it. You might have things out away from the house. Where did you grow your flowers? You commonly had what was called a cutting garden, where you had like a vegetable garden, you had some rows and flowers were just planted in rows. Those were strictly to be cut, to be taken and used in the house. If you go to Mount Vernon, for example, there is a flower garden, but there's a cutting section over to one side. Some flowers in the garden were to be enjoyed as blooming outdoor flowers. The row ones that were planted like a crop were where you cut the ones to bring them into the house. One of my favorite house museums in America is the Hillwood Museum in Washington, D.C., the home of the late Marjorie mm -hmm. Mary Wood Post. There's a cutting garden there. And she had access to every wholesale house in Washington, D.C., but loved that when flowers were on her table that had grown on the property. She also had a greenhouse because she liked orchids. Uh, let me see if I've covered all my other little, oh, oh, the little urns, where the little roses are on the table. It seems horrible now that people would smoke at a table, but in the 19th century, it was very common for people to smoke at the table. Uh, not the 19th century, the early 20th century. In the 19th century, men were not supposed to smoke in the presence of ladies. So when a meal ended, there were oftentimes double parlors with sliding doors. Have you been to the Hermitage in Nashville? Andrew Jackson's house? There are double parlors and sliding doors between the two. The men would have gone to one room, the women would have gone to another room. The men could smoke a cigar and not be in the presence of ladies. They could have brandy and not be offensive in the presence of ladies. They could talk about politics. And that was, in, that was offensive in the presence of ladies because... Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. Until 1920. When was the, who was the last state in the country to allow women to vote? Probably Alabama. 
Alabama, a record we're not proud to hold, but not until the election of 1920 when the Constitution mandated that it had to happen by amendment. Otherwise, we still wouldn't be voting, ladies. The first state, in, the first state I think, was Wyoming in 1890, so 30 years before Alabama, women were voting in other places. Um, let me see if I cover up. The, oh, these little things. These, these little things were cigarette urns. These were placed between each two guests with a small little ashtray in front of them. And somebody over here brought part of a, a, a set that they had. You could get them in your china pattern. Uh, Francis I made a sterling silver lighter. They made cigarette urns. They made little ashtrays. But these belonged to George Cooper, who was the original director of Gone with the Wind. I collect Gone with the Wind things. And when he died and there was an estate sale, I saw these listed in the a state catalog, and I thought it'd be interesting to have. So there are two pairs. The bigger pair are English, and the smaller pair, I think, are American. The far ends are a pair, and the two closer ends are a pair. But I always use them as little miniature flower containers. Um, and I'm about to wind up here in a minute. Another interesting connection of this set of dishes. I used it one time. I was always afraid to use them because if you broke one, it wasn't like you could go on eBay and find another piece and replace what you were missing one. So uh, I have had several Gone with the Wind events and guests, and we had in 2011 the biggest Gone with the Wind show ever in the United States for the 75th anniversary of when the book came out. And our special guest was Mickey Kuhn. Mickey Kuhn was Melanie's little boy, Bo. When Melanie's dying, the boy says, where's my mother going and why can't I go with her? He's the last person alive whose name appears in the credits of Gone with the Wind, and he was my house guest. And I thought, if they're going to use those dishes, this might be the time to pull them out. I've got to tell people to turn the phone off. Uh, I thought if you're going to use them, this is the time to use them. You'll always remember who you used them for. So I used them that one single time. Place cards, the little place card holders are miniature Fabergé eggs with the people's names on them. Uh, in the 19th century, rather than a place card, family members would have had a monogrammed napkin ring or a figural napkin like a sculpture that the napkin went through the middle of, napkins were not laundered after every meal. If you had breakfast and you used your napkin, you put it through your ring and at the place that was your traditional place. And when you came back to lunch or dinner, you used the same napkin again. Think about the headache of hand washing all these things in pots you boiled outside, and then somebody had to starch them, and somebody had to iron them, and somebody had to fold them. So it wasn't like just pulling off paper towels now when I have informal company and saying, here, here's your napkin. Um, a napkin ring would have been probably modern ring. Uh, you would have had place cards at a major event. If you had gone to something like at the White House, very formally seated. If you go to Buckingham Palace, they know exactly who's seated by what order and what protocol and who sits by who. One reason why you could have had taller things like this in the 19th century if you wanted to was you didn't talk to people across the table routinely. If you went to a fancy do, if you went to Buckingham Palace now, and you went to a fancy dinner that the Queen was hosting for you, for half of the meal, you were to talk to the person on one side of you. For half of the meal, you were to talk to the person on the other side of you. You were not to exchange conversations back and forth. And besides, instead of being this wide, the table would be this wide. It was impractical to try to get across. At Buckingham Palace at uh, Windsor Castle, when they do a fancy meal, the centerpiece container is five feet tall. The butler gets up on the table with padded shoes, padded booties, walks down the table to set the candelabras and things in place because they're all this high. It takes them two days to set the table up to do a full production meal. I allow a day or day and a half to do mine when I'm, when I'm having a fancy meal. Uh, let me see if I've covered all my stuff. We talked about dollies. We talked about courses, we talked about different sizes of stuff. Oh, one last thing. Mustache cups. Lots of folks had facial hair in the 19th century. You won't get any of what you were drinking. This is the only silver one I've ever seen. I found it in a steak sale one time. But oftentimes with your china, there were cups and saucers, but there would be some that were mustache cups and saucers because almost all guys who could raise a crop of something had something. And that kept it out of getting into the cup. My other stuff across the hall, there's a text panel that tells about R.S. Prussia. That's what I collect and literally wrote the book on. But uh, two pieces I'll show you and I'm winding up to finish. Lots of people China painted in the 19th century. It was a very popular hobby for ladies. 
When I was growing up, lots of my mother's friends did China paintings. They were ladies in town who taught China. Maybe the Elma Stanley, our neighbor, taught China painting. Ladies came and took China painting lessons. Um, R.S. Crashaw, R.S. Germany, sometimes produced what was called the blank. That's what this is. It's an unpainted piece. It was made to be exported like this. And this is a blank somebody bought and then painted. And they've signed it. Their name is on the bottom. They pearlized the inside, and they've done their own little original decor on it. So I didn't put it over there to tell you about it on that side. But that was China painting was all the rage at that particular time. And I think Lucy Hayes, wrote for B. Hayes' wife, was a, was a noted China painter herself. Uh, any quick questions about anything before we wind up our, our time? I covered everything you thought you ever wanted to know about in your life history. Well, I'm waiting for you to take the table down on your dance. <laughs> well, that's only after the final show today. <laughs> I'm saving myself for something. I can only do one. Like, you know, like what time of day did people eat traditional? This meal would have been probably late at night. It might not have been served until 8 o'clock at night. Oh. Uh, breakfast would have been very early. Oftentimes on the plantation, breakfast was at 7 o'clock in the morning. Ladies didn't get up that early, so that's oftentimes why a tray was taken. Everybody's saying gone with the wind. Scarlett wakes up in the bed, there's this enormous tray in the bed with her. It's because ladies weren't seen that early in the morning. You had to get all corseted up and sucked in and laced and all that kind of stuff, so you didn't want to get up and have anybody see you. So tray, your tray would have been brought to you. But men would get up early because they would go out and be doing stuff. Oftentimes, if they were hunting, they'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Lunch might have been done until 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then the later evening meal might have been maybe 8 o'clock at night. It was cooler and more comfortable. Too. Ah. And remember, there was no air conditioning and there was no screen wire in the early 19th century and mid-19th century. So when you opened the windows, there was nothing to keep bugs from flying. And that's why sheer curtains were so popular. We use them as a decoration now. They were used as a bug retardant back then. Any other questions? I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoy the displays.